Welcome back and alive now. I'm Austin Westfall. A live look at Tel Aviv where it is Wednesday morning. I do want to get the latest on the Israel Hamas war. Dr. Alone Burstein joining us as always. Alone, it's good to see you. It's not every day that we get to report on good news. Let's get into this. Israeli special forces have recovered an Israeli hostage from a tunnel in southern Gaza in a complex rescue operation, according to the military on Tuesday. This is more than 10 months after the man was abducted by Hamas-led gunmen. He's 52-year-old Kaid Foran Al-Qadi, and he's from southern Israel and was working as a security guard on a kibbutz near the Gaza border when he was taken captive. He was in Gaza for 326 days alone. What do we know about how the IDF got this done? Good to see you, Austin. Yes, this is um, was a very uplifting day in terms of another hostage coming home. It's also a very almost bizarre story of the way that rescue operation unfolded. According to what we know, the IDF was operating in Hanunas, in the tunnels in this region in Hanunas, not disclosed what region it was. You know, the IDF has been carrying out a lot of operations in Hanunas in the last several weeks. We've seen them issuing new evacuation orders to Palestinian civilians in the Abbasan regions in the east, as well as all the way into the what's known as the Qatari neighborhood in the west. We don't know exactly where this was. According to what was published, the IDF had some intelligence suggestions, not accurate intelligence, intelligence suggestions, that a hostage may be held in one of the tunnels in one of the regions. It then sent special forces into the tunnels essentially to do a blind search. To, unlike the other operations, we saw the operation that rescued different hostages in different, uh, different areas of the Gaza Strip, very, very focused. The IDF did not launch those operations until it knew the exact apartment where hostages were being held here. The soldiers, according to what was, has been published, were literally going through the tunnel and just looking room by room and searching. These tunnels have a lot of Hamas operatives. They, some of them are rigged with bombs. And according to what the hostage told us, what, the, what Al-Qadi has said after his release, when his captors heard the IDF soldiers approaching, they simply fled. He didn't know what was going on. He's held you know, in a bit of a separate room. He didn't know what was going on. He was waiting there only when he heard the IDF soldiers going past the area speaking in Hebrew. Did he realize that they fled because of that? He reported that he was very scared to leave the room because he didn't know if possibly the area was rigged, possibly not. And in addition, another almost you know, Hollywood-style characteristic of this operation, the IDF didn't know who they were looking for specifically. So when he emerged, they didn't know, is this a hostage? Is this a Hamas operative? Who is this person? So apparently at the beginning, there was some initial suspicion and talking from both sides until they confirmed who he is. One of the hostages managed to rescue him. According to what we know, he was held alone for a large part of the time. He said that he was with a group of hostages in the first couple of months, but then separated and held alone in this tunnel. A very sort of surprising development compared to the way the war has been run thus far and whatever successful rescue operations have been thus far. This one, very strange so far. We'll probably learn more in the coming days where it was exactly in Hanunas, and maybe the IDF is still operating there. Maybe that's why they're having a media blackout of where this was. Obviously, we'll learn more soon. What's the significance of them finding a live hostage in a tunnel? This was a complex op operation underground. What do you make of the fact that they made this happen in one of these now infamous tunnels? This is the first hostage that was actually rescued alive from a tunnel. Up until now, all of the hostages that have been retrieved from tunnels have been the bodies of hostages. The IDF has developed, um, unfortunately, a very, very good expertise in fighting in these tunnels. You know, part, a lot of people within the IDF, specifically in the intelligence branch, but also within different engineering branches, have been saying that when the war started, they had no clue, you know, forgive me for being like so extreme, they had no clue what to do with these tunnels because there is no other array of tunnels in the world that has been built like this by a terrorist organization. All of the different theories, the different programs, the different trainings that different militaries have done in order to know how to fight in urban warfare have very little to do with fighting in tunnels. The IDF has almost written the new theory, the new theory book, the new guidance for how to fight in tunnels. And the IDF has gotten better at that. At the beginning of the war, there were a lot of soldiers killed because they were going to tunnels that were rigged. They didn't know exactly what to find. Unfortunately, we also have learned that it is possible that some of the hostages that have been found in tunnels in more than northern parts of the Gaza Strip died either as a result of IDF bombings when the IDF was not being careful of tunnels 
or possibly that they were still alive when soldiers were in the tunnel or in an adjacent tunnel back in the time when the IDF did not know how to fight in the tunnels. By now, the IDF has become much more professional in knowing how to deal with those tunnels, and that and we see the result now in this operation. Like they said, a lot of the, the suspicion that a lot of tunnels were rigged. One of the things that the IDF has started saying in the last weeks is unlike what was thought at the beginning of the war, we already know that the tunnel array in the Gaza Strip is much more advanced than was, was suggested by the IDF prior to the war. One of the things that they have said that's different than even they were saying six months in is there's a suspicion now that most of the tunnels are actually connected to one another. At first, it was being reported that there is a strip of tunnel, a mile long, strip of tunnel, three miles long. And now they're starting to learn that actually a lot of the tunnels are connected through hidden passageways, reinforced concrete that blocks off the tunnel, but that the, the Hamas movement knows how to open or detonate in order to flee through. The idea is learning much more about this very, very complex system that Hamas has built in the Gaza Strip. I want to expand on the hostages. How many hostages, uh, and we actually have the number, 108 uh, is, is what the Israeli government is saying. They say today one hostage was reunited with his family. 108 are still anxiously waiting to come home. Now we get back to work. What do we know about the other hostages' status alone? Maybe the better question is, do we know anything about their status? So I'm going to start by taking a step back and just talking about like the, the numbers of the hostage situation. 251 hostages were kidnapped on October 7th. And in addition to that, there were four Israelis that were already in the Gaza Strip, two bodies of, sorry, the bodies of two IDF soldiers, and two Israeli civilians. So total 255, that's what's being negotiated in the war. Of them, 117 have been brought back alive. That includes 105 that were brought back in the hostage deal in November, another four that were released by Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad as humanitarian gestures in October, and a total of eight who were rescued alive by the IDF. In addition to that, 30 hostages, the, their bodies, were retrieved by the IDF during the act of fighting. So that in terms of what the IDF has managed to retrieve through fighting, it's eight alive, 30 bodies, and then there are another 100, almost 117 um, that have been returned alive in the hostage deals. Then we have 108 who remain in the Gaza Strip. Of them, the IDF has officially confirmed that 36 are already dead. So th that, as far as Israel is concerned, is a fact. However, it is very, very likely that the IDF actually has information, that Israel has information, that many more of them are dead. According to different intelligence leaks that have been published both in New York Times and Washington Post and different places, U.S. intelligence and Israeli intelligence estimate that there are likely only between 50 and 70 hostages that remain alive, and that was published two or three months ago. So then the estimate was 50 to 70. The latest estimates are saying maybe 55. Unclear. One of the reasons for the disparity that the IDF is saying officially 36, whereas according to these intelligence leaks, the IDF estimates that at least 60 or 70 are dead, there's two reasons for that. One is part of the negotiations. Part of the negotiations, the IDF cannot confirm, but the IDF is treating people as though they're alive, so that's just part of the tactic. In addition to that, however, one of the factors that, that really determine if the IDF to, uh, will say definitively someone is dead or not is religious authority. The IDF also has rabbinical councils and for its Muslim soldiers, you know, Muslim clerics, and they need to have certain facts in order to determine that someone is dead or not. So for example, one of the things that often complicates things is the IDF has video footage sometimes of a hostage that shows that they have been killed. But that may not be enough for you know, a religious cleric to determine because if you can't retrieve the body or something like that. That's the reason for this disparity that on the one hand, the IDF is confirming 36 are dead. On the other hand, it is very likely that Israel knows that many more are dead, that only 50 or 55 remain alive at this point. And some leaks from the negotiations also suggest that Israel is really treating the, the cohort of live hostages as much less than what is the official number. So that's where we are at this point. You know, this is the first time I've talked with you, and, and we'll play this video out from earlier this weekend. This is the first time you and I have talked since Israel carried out preemptive strikes against Hezbollah over the weekend, squashing what appeared to be a large-scale Hezbollah attack before it could even happen. Hezbollah had vowed to carry out this would-be attack in retaliation for the IDF 
killing their second in command in Beirut recently. Now that we're 72 hours removed from all of that alone, let's take the temperature of the region. Has the risk of escalation decreased since Saturday? It would appear so. Hezbollah, like Iran, vowed to carry out a retaliation. However, almost all intelligence sources suggested that neither of those actors, neither Iran nor Hezbollah, want a full-blown war, want a full-blown regional escalation. They want to retaliate, much like we saw, by the way, back in April, when Israel carried out that attack, or at least all sources attributed to Israel carried out that attack in the Iranian consulate. Then Iran vowed to retaliate, but Iran carried out the retaliation, hoping it wouldn't lead to a regional escalation, as it did not. It's unclear what Hezbollah was exactly planning. According to IDF leaks, Hezbollah had primed 6,000 rockets and missiles that they were going to launch towards the heart of Israel. It is not possible that Hezbollah was going to do that and did not want a full-on escalation. If that was, in fact, Hezbollah's plan, then they were looking for a full-on escalation. The fact that Hezbollah sort of took its punch from the IDF, the IDF carried out the largest attack it carried out in Lebanon in well over 20 years, certainly since the war began, you know, an array of over 100 warplanes carry out over 270 airstrikes simultaneously, pretty much, within about 15 to 20 minutes. Hezbollah, you know, quote-unquote, only managed to fire roughly 300 to 350 missiles and rockets. They seem, though, to have taken that punch and been okay with it. They took that punch. Hezbollah announced the first phase of our retaliation is done. They also made clear Israel still has to wait for the big retaliation, but they added something very interesting. Hassan Nasrallah in his speech says, Israel's waiting period is not over. They still need to wait for the retaliation from Iran and from the Houthis. That's very different than what he was saying in the last month. The last month he's been talking about our retaliation, the regional retaliation. Now all of a sudden he was saying, look, there's still going to be a regional escalation, but he implied not from us. So... I'm not sure what to make of that. On the one hand, the IDF says that Hezbollah is going to launch this massive array that would have undoubtedly led to a regional flare-up. On the other hand, it does appear that Hezbollah took this punch and sort of said, okay, for now, we are de-escalating. So as far as the north of Israel is concerned and the south of Lebanon, things have returned to, you know, an absolute insane st status quo in which there are, you know, the quote-unquote only 50 to 100 rockets being fired every day by Hezbollah and quote-unquote only, you know, IDF air, airstrikes that are carried out in Lebanon. That has returned to normal and it appears to, to be the current status quo where we're going back to again. Remains to be seen what happens with Iran, though. Iran still vowed escalation, still vowed retaliation for the assassination of Ismail Haniya. They have not backed away from that. They've made all kinds of statements suggesting they may do it later, they may defer, they may this. But the Pentagon just announced, I think, yesterday that they're still identifying signs that Iran is preparing that retaliation. A lot depends on the outcome of the negotiations. You know, there's ongoing negotiations that are going on right now in Qatar before in Cairo, and neither one of these actors want to be seen as those who maybe there was a chance for a ceasefire in Gaza, but they torpedoed it. So I think they're waiting to see if the negotiations break down. That's when we'll see the next flare-up in the Middle East. We'll leave it there for now alone. Take care. We always look forward to your daily YouTube uploads. Have a good night.